And it's not because we're smarter than Aristotle, he's a smart man. But we have something he didn't have, we have the Bible. And so, therefore, that's where we get these ideas. And, and from pagan antiquity or neo-paganism or all the modernisms, you, you get the opposite. After studying this topic for the last two years and reading literally hundreds of their books and articles and speeches, I've come to the conclusion, whether the left knows it or not, their plans and goals can all be summed up very simply. They are at war with God. A people that are moral and believe their rights come from God would not only never want what they're selling, but would also never need it. And they know that. Discovered that they could 
uh, do more to remake our country by going into the schools uh, than they could by throwing bonds. I believe the average patriotic American underestimates the importance and influence education has on their children. That's how the large majority we had in 1980 to elect Ronald Reagan in a landslide has been lost. It's not because the other side has had lots of children. No, they're boarding theirs. But instead they are capturing ours through the propaganda they teach them seven hours a day for 13 years and even longer if they attend college. We are losing most of our children to the other side because of the anti-American, anti-God, and anti-free enterprise rhetoric they are filled with in the government schools. Government schools are not teaching basic reasoning processes. They're not teaching logic. They're not teaching actual data of history and science and mathematics. And if your education is rather limited, then you're inclined to believe that government can be the solution to your problems. When you look at the desks in the schoolroom, you'll find four together, or maybe a table, they sit around people. Independent desks are very rare in most classrooms because they don't want to promote a self-sufficiency, independent mindset. You go back to William Z. Foster in his book, Towards Soviet America, you will see how uh, he has a whole chapter there on how we have to supplant education in this country and ultimately force every student to attend public school. That's the other thing. I hope the homeschoolers get catch on to this. The homeschoolers and the Christian day school movement are going to have some very rough times ahead of them because the public school crowd cannot afford to have any competition. And they're having and they're being given plenty of competition by the homeschoolers right now. You see the effects of that in mode educational standards. There's no more studying of the classics or studying of the civics or you know how the US Constitution was formed. It's it's all progressive education. It's all based on the identity politics, the isms, the current trend, the isms, environmentalism, oh, racism. They're training them for the collective, and a collective mindset, and a dependency mindset. And it seems that they, again, want to have people be uneducated, so then they do become wards of the state. They're dependent on the government to provide everything for them. It's under 10% of kids believe that, that there is an absolute right and an absolute wrong. And now, why are we surprised? We've sent our kids into this government system that indoctrinates them, that teaches them about tolerance and diversity and multiculturalism and not about reading, writing, and arithmetic, not about what our founding fathers had to say. It's, it's consequences. Few would argue that the education the children are receiving in the public schools is pathetic at best. But with the amount of tax dollars we spend each year, over twice as much as it would cost to send the students to private school, why do we allow this to continue? The group that my investigation led me to that seems dedicated to making sure the children don't get a good education was a real shocker. Uh, the uh, schools are, are pretty much controlled by the Teachers Union, the National Education Association. If you look at their platform, so uh, you would think they were a socialist or almost communistic organization. They are for the entire feminist agenda, uh, starting with abortion on demand, tax-funded abortions. They're for the whole gay rights agenda. Uh, they're for the whole globalism agenda. They are extremely apparent. It, it, is a, it is an effort to get the children to abandon the values of their parents. National Education Association has no uh, patience, tolerance, or use for traditional teachers. They're looking for people who want to be agents of change. They want to throw out all the lessons of history. And really it's an attempt to then impose their own views and ideas onto people, get them to act as activists. But if you control those institutions, then you can control everything else. It's all public schools, all for their jobs, and they have gotten behind all the radical kinds of curriculum that's being introduced. They're for it 100%. They've had a tremendous effect on public education. It's not positive. 
We also see immorality being promoted through our schools, the kind of sex ed curriculum that is being used and paid for with our tax dollars would shock most parents. I think one of the main problems we face is parents naively thinking that the schools are the same today as they were when they were young. They don't realize there is a battle going on in this country for the hearts and minds of our children. The game is between 15 and 25 years of age. That's the whole game. If you're over 25, the chances are they're going to put a few pennies towards you to corrupt you. But their game right now is to corrupt the 15 to 25 year olds or less. And right now they're down in the first grade with Heather has two mommies, daddy's roommate, uh, gay pride parade. And now by eighth grade, they'll pass out condoms and school colors because that's so patriotic. And it's perfectly obvious that you get a hold of the child early, you can change his values away from his parents' values and get him to follow you. And they're very open about saying that. The National Education Association has passed a resolution saying they want children from birth. Isn't that interesting? The Communist Manifesto also thought the state should take control of children at birth. The left has always been good at disguising their real agenda by coming up with phrases made from words we are very familiar with, but then giving them new definitions. Social justice is the current phrase of choice and is being used to teach children the failed Marxist ideas of yesteryear or what they should strive for today. We see social justice curriculum today, which is the buzzword for communism, socialism, Marxism which Bill Ayers is teaching. It's in many of our colleges, and the social justice curriculum is being taught in high schools all over the nation. Justice is good. If you then start calling something blank justice, then you're modifying it. And what it really means is, I think, taking from one group of people and giving to another group. So I would call it socialism. And it's used to uh, break down the differences between the way things are done and the way it should be done. So when they're teaching social justice in the schools, they're not talking about free enterprise and capitalism and individual self-responsibility, all the things that made America great. They're talking about the things that made, it, made Europe and the Soviet Union and China so bad. The longer we allow our schools to teach the children that America has so many faults, it's not worth saving, instead of the fact that even with its faults, it is the greatest country that has ever existed, the less chance we have of ever turning our people back from the dead-end road we're currently on. A road that promises to give us a perfect world if we'll only give up our sovereignty and our freedom. You're going to find more and more of the following. This is now called a world pledge. We no longer want the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America because that is considered nationalistic and of course the socialist communists and the Marxist and the extreme left wing in the country uh, want nothing to do with it. I pledge allegiance to the world to care for earth, sea, and air, to honor every living thing with <coughs> peace and justice everywhere. This came out first of all in Superior, Wisconsin. So Superior, Wisconsin was their guinea pig and there was very little uh, set against it, and so it would then go to the next and the next and the next, and before long you have the whole school system standing up saying, I pledge allegiance to the world instead of I pledge allegiance to the U.S. The public schools right now, if you'll read towards Soviet America, have nearly accepted every item that William Z. Foster said we needed to place into the public school curriculum. And we're seeing results, you know, people are not as informed as they once were, they think in different ways, and they think in the way that the left intends them to think. Antonio Gramsci realized that if you can take over the institutions and the culture, you will be able to use those to influence society to create the socialist man you want. I think the most brilliant part of his plan was that he realized you could not only create a man that wanted big government to take care of him cradle to grave, but, and this is the genius of Gramsci, you could create a man that needed big government to take care of him cradle to grave. 
a man so dumbed down and so minimized in society, he wouldn't have the intellect or character to take care of himself. The reason this is so deadly for America is that once we have a certain percentage of the population in that category, our limited constitutional form of government is no longer possible because too many people won't be able to exist in that framework. We are approaching that tipping point rapidly. If you can persuade people that government should be in control of the distribution and use of energy, you can persuade them, or rather, you have persuaded them of the necessary and sufficient condition for government control of the most intimate aspects of our lives. One of the main uh, thrusts of socialism these days is obviously through the environmental movement. You know, one hates to pick on Al Gore too quickly and easily, uh, but I read the whole of his book, Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit, back in 1992 when it was first published. And if you, if you know anything about the history of political philosophy, you, you read the last chapter in that called A Global Marshall Plan, and you understand that there is no way to implement what Al Gore was calling for in 1992 in that book except by means of totalitarian world government. Patrick Moore, who was a co-founder of Greenpeace, he was a very dedicated environmentalist, quit Greenpeace when he realized that had been captured by radical leftists who were intent on using the environmental movement as a vehicle to destroy capitalism. How many factories work when there's a power outage? None. You want to hurt business. You want to drive down industrial production. You just drive up the prices of energy. You just diminish its availability. And the easiest way to do that is to make people scared to death of the cheapest forms of energy, which are fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear energy. They had already made people afraid of nuclear because of irrational fears, uh, but then they had to figure out a way to make them afraid of, of fossil fuels. Well, the way to do that was to say they're going to cause catastrophic global warming. So I used to think this was just one great big distraction. They want to end, put their energies toward the environment, but now I see that this is now being turned around and used as a tool to further a socialist agenda. Charles Rubin, a political scientist who wrote the book The Green Crusade, has told this story extremely well. Environment comes from a French word meaning surroundings. Well, now, what is surroundings? everything around you, right? And so as Rubin points out, environmentalism is literally everything it's And so if you were a socialist committed ideologically to the notion of government having control of everything about our lives, and you saw that you were losing the contest in terms of the creation of wealth and its distribution to capitalism, you had to find some other basis on which to promote your vision of government and to pursue its implementation. Environmentalism, or everything, was the perfect card. In December of 2009, when the Klanagate scandal broke open, and it became public that even the leaders of the movement knew the whole global warming idea was a farce, it wasn't them just having bad data, we as Americans knew once and for all that this movement was simply part of their agenda. It's my guess that regardless of the evidence that comes out against them, they will not let this tool they have waited the last hundred years for go to waste. A tool that gives them the absolute power and control they want, but allows them to get it under the guise of saving the planet.
was born of left-wing parents. He was mentored as a young man by a Communist Party member called Frank Marshall Davis. Now Davis joined the Communist Party in Chicago and was very well connected there. So young Obama eventually wound up in Chicago and he started working with the very same people that had been working with his friend Frank Marshall Davis. All of his associations have been with people that are way left to center, hardcore left. And he, he's doing nothing more than, than what is predictable based upon that background. The nicest word for his agenda is the socialist agenda. And we could go on down the line of the, the other descriptors of the, the types of an economy and a society that he's building. It's all the things that Gramsci wanted to use for social change. Yeah, you see the epitome of the movement. If you think there's no way that so few could be so effective, consider this. When the Communist Party USA split in 1992, the group that formed was the Committees of Correspondence, and it was their meeting I attended that summer at Berkeley. As I started researching that group, I saw that many of the same people who started or have worked with the Committees of Correspondence and its sister organizations were the same people who were involved with President Obama's campaign and administration. I found file after file on Trevor Loudon's website documenting with footnotes and photographs these connections. The radical left has been so successful they have persuaded the American people to put one of their own in the White House. Socialism and Marxism go together like Mary and Mary's little lamb. The general populist knows very little about what, what the socialists are up to. If you're going to find socialism, you're going to find, the, you're going to find the hardcore communists right behind it. One of the main avenues has been through what they call the, the Congressional Progressive Caucus. 20% of the U.S. Congress are members of this organization. They have chairmanships of, of most of the major house committees and are easily the single most powerful bloc in the U.S. Congress. And virtually all of them are tied to either Democratic Socialists of America, the Communist Party, USA, or other radical organizations. We're literally at this very time watching what's transpiring and has been going on from the Fabian Socialist point of view from 1883 to the present. So these guys don't give up. And they're going at a breakneck <coughs> speed because they know they've got an opportunity now to change America in a way that can never be changed back. They're going for broke. The Bolsheviks, they're just waiting in the woods, and they're just smiling like you can't believe. You just read the Communist Party USA uh, blog, and they just can't believe their good fortune. Every time they turn around, they just can't believe this is happening. They're like me. I'm a Christian conservative, and I can't believe they, they've been so successful in doing this. The left has started multitudes of foundations and nonprofit organizations, many of which are using our tax dollars to grind America down. Uh, they use all kinds of patriotic words uh, to masquerade an extreme leftist uh, orientation. Uh, which, if anything, would uh, enslave the people uh, in uh, the same kinds of things with the same kind of ultimate results as communism had. The communists will let the socialists go so far, and then ultimately the communists really turn on their fellow socialists and they wipe them out too. Uh, and their attitude, I think, is really uh, probably pretty close. They figure, look, if these socialists betrayed their own country, the chances are once we get in power, they'll betray us too. So they'll figure, let's just rub them out right now. And at, at a given point, you'll see in the history of communism that they've been very effective at rubbing out their fellow socialists who brought about their socialism before the Bolsheviks and the, and the hardcore uh, communists with a capital C took them over. One thing we do really have to recognize is this is a domestic enemy. This is not just people with different ideas. These are not just nice folks who have funny, silly ideas that they will eventually figure out are just not very mature. No, these people are dangerous, dangerous enemies and they are intent on overthrowing this country and imposing a socialist system that will mean 
extreme hardship for the vast majority of people in this country. That's true with them constantly seeking to re-engineer society so they reach this level of utopian perfection. Where we on the other side, um, we, we advance the idea that this is about the cause of freedom. And if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ, there never would have been a United States of America. Because the inspiration for freedom drove our founding fathers. They were informed by their faith, and I believe guided by the hand of God. No, no, perhaps uh, treacherously close. It is never over until it's over. When the fat lady sings, isn't that the slogan? And when the fat lady sings, it's over. Now, she might be clearing her throat. We saw the great country of Germany in the 1920s brought to its knees. Hitler came into power and destroyed the country. We see countries like Zimbabwe in Africa, which was once a prosperous breadbasket now just wrecked. Argentina was, was destroyed by the socialist Peron in the 50s. It was one of the richest countries in the world. So, no, we're not at the point of no return, but it's, it's getting pretty late in the day. There's not, there's, there's no time to be casual, that's for sure. We've spent too many years thinking, because we have Republicans in office, while the stock market is doing well, that everything's okay. This is why the left has gained so much ground. It doesn't matter who's been in office. They've just continued pushing forward with their agenda. Well, I believe this is our last <coughs> chance to push back. If people are looking for something to do, we have our work cut out for us. I believe one of the things that we can do that will have a profound impact in changing America is praying. As soon as we get off our knees, we need to get on our feet. We become educated about what's going on in the country. We spend time reading, understand their philosophy and their goals. They have to master this documentary. They have to go over it a dozen times. It might be having a monthly movie night with family and friends watching one of the many great documentaries out there about what is going on in our country. One of the things that I think uh, people in the, in the United States who believe in our country, believe in our values, can do, quite frankly, is stand up for those values, uh, to make their views known. And there's times that you got to speak up, and you've got to call things what they are. We need to be willing to be criticized and to not be silent because of the criticism. It was Martin Luther who said, if we're faithful on all battlefronts besides, it's precisely where the battle's the hottest, then we're traitors to the cause. I like the quote by Abraham Lincoln who said that silence makes cowards out of the best of men. And we got a lot of people that need to be speaking up right now. We have an obligation to speak the truth about the policies that are taking us 180 degrees from God's, God's will. Expand within your church. Expand within the people you have contact. Bring them up to speed and knowledge on what's going on. We need to organize those around us by simply mobilizing the unique groups of people we are in contact with and being their source of information, we can have an extraordinary effect. Lenin said that the organized minority will beat the disorganized majority every time. Why should we be buying products from companies that are going to fund organizations that attack our values. They need to uh, be really smart in using the mass media. They might want to blog. Using the power of, of YouTube and that sort of thing to educate as many people as possible. A good YouTube video can reach millions of people. And um, if Susan Boyle can do it, why can't we? If you do the right kinds of things on YouTube that are creative and do them frequently, you can drive a message through society influencing millions at almost no cost. We need to be the people who graciously but consistently make contact and express to those folks we elected what we want them to do, and what we believe in, what we think is right. And if they don't follow us, then we need to make efforts to get them out and get other people in them with them. Pick the good ones and stick to them. Don't waste the time on people who won't stand up for the country. All the others are the people who really want to honor America need to make contact. We also need to be influencing our own families. 
We've got to teach our own children and grandchildren the difference between truth and error, why they believe the things they do, and the true source of America's greatness. If what we're talking about is true, the most important thing we can do is protect our young, because that is where all of this is leading. They need to get that younger generation under their belt. And more and more parents are going to have to say, that they're just going to have to sacrifice and take responsibility for their kids' ed education, because that's really where it starts, to impart that belief. The Southern Baptists, we're seeing that 85% of their kids, after they get out of their home, are essentially rejecting their faith, rejecting what they were taught. And of course, I think the reason for that is because their parents didn't have a lot of influence over them. I believe the public schools are the greatest cultural influence in this country. You homeschool your kids and get them in a Christian day school. If there is any way at all, homeschool your children. Homeschoolers outtask everybody. Our children need to be taught from Scripture a properly biblical worldview. That requires time. It requires effort. It requires purpose. Our minds should be the sharpest minds in the world. We need to work within our family to educate our children on what kind of country they live in and build their faith. And then get involved. The left has been working for decades to push us away from God and His laws. And we need to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes to turn our country back to Him. Throughout our history as Americans, though, there has always been a great price to be paid for preserving, protecting, and defending this great land. The people who built America paid a great price. Uh, the, the people who went to war for our nation, boy, did they pay a price. And one of the American values was, we will pay a price for what is right. We will give of ourselves even if it requires the giving of our lives. That was an American value. That's why it is such a heroic and honorable thing when a soldier defending us pays that price. That's like when you go to Arlington Cemetery in Washington or the tomb of the unknown. You stand there and you say, this is America. We were the people who so believed in these values that it's an honor to stand for, even if it can cost you your very life. One thing I think we knew, do need to remember, though, is that as we look at those we consider to be heroes in the past, they weren't people who just went along with the status quo. They weren't people who were just saying what was accepted at that time in history. They were people who were rising up above the evil that was being committed in their culture at that time. <coughs> That's why they were heroes, because they weren't like everyone else. Never ever lose sight of the power of one individual American. They, have, they can have an unbelievable magnifying effect just by the very fact they make up their mind to do so. The hope is in this, as Francis Schaeffer said, that as the dull ache of the human soul can no longer be filled with material prosperity, people are going to turn to spiritualism, whether it be pagan spirituality or biblical Christianity. We know according to the Denver Post, June of 2008, pagan spirituality is doubling in America every 18 months. So we better get out there because I'll tell you, pagan spirituality and Christianity will both get you to God, but one get you there as your judge, as your savior. If we humble ourselves, we fall to our knees, if we seek His face, we pray and we turn from our wicked ways, then we have a chance for God to hear from heaven, to forgive our sins, and heal our land. Uh, and if we are being judged, then we need to use this as an opportunity to show people that uh, this judgment in this life is nothing compared to the judgment that's to come, is eternal, and really make them understand the importance of uh, fleeing God's wrath by accepting Him, repenting of their sins through faith and repentance. I believe that's the only chance, the only hope we have as a nation. Hope is not found in rhetoric. Hope is found in God, the God of creation. And you know what? Our founders were in covenant with that God. You need a dedicated, informed, praying Christian making things happen and being determined to do so.
time has only allowed me to present a fraction of what I found. The reason I called this film Agenda is because I wanted to make a clear distinction between what I was researching and all the conspiracy theories out there. The dictionary says a conspiracy is an evil plan formulated in secret by two or more persons, but an agenda is simply a list of things to be done. At every turn of my investigation, I found agendas by people and groups of the left outlining their plan in their own words. They've been doing most of this right out in the open. Some of you might be thinking, these Marxist ideas aren't the most serious threat we face. What about militant Islam, our open borders, the national debt, or even China? Well, I agree. America is facing so many serious threats right now. But the reason I believe this is the most dire is because it's destroying us on the inside. Through the political correctness and dumbing down, it's causing us to lose our ability to call evil evil and stand against it. <coughs> I fear for our country. If we go along business as usual, not informed, not aware of what's going on, then the very small minority that have a plan and are great at organizing the uninformed and misguided will make sure their plan is carried out. I hope you realize it won't just be your children and grandchildren that pay the horrific price of living in the society they're trying to create. No, it will be far worse than that. Every time a, a civilization goes down or a country goes down, militarily or economically, somebody else fills the gap. Now, if you look around the world now, it's going to be China, which is massively arming. You've got, the, you've got Russia, which is becoming increasingly belligerent. You've got the radical Islamic world, which works hand in glove with the Russians and the Chinese all the time. You've got eventually red Latin America. Um, you've got a neutral socialist Europe. So America hasn't got a lot of friends left in the world. Now, that's just not going to affect America. That's going to affect every single remaining country in the free world. Who's going to stand up to China if America doesn't? Who's going to stand up to the Russians? Is Europe going to do it? Australia, New Zealand, Canada? Not a chance. If America, and this is the point I think Americans need to comprehend. If America goes down economically, it will go down militarily. If America goes down militarily, we all go down. The free world is finished and will be finished for a very, very long time.